Welcome. Welcome to all of you. Classes are just getting out. There will be some more people coming in, but let's get, us, get ourselves started. This is the first, as you know, of our Dean's Speaker Series for the year. This is our highest level speaker series. There are many wonderful people that will be coming. Uh, in fact, even this month, John Chambers, Cisco, uh, Michael Lewis, uh, many others uh, will, be, will be here. Uh, I want to talk about our event today. So this is the kickoff of our series and a topic that has been around since business has been around, not always framed in this nomenclature. We're here to talk about uh, a teach-in, if you will, but framed as a debate, uh, shareholders versus stakeholders. Uh, in whose interests should we be running business or even more broadly society, but specifically uh, the business sector? What kind of advice, guidance should we give to managers? How do we think about that in terms, ultimately, of business school curriculum? These are among the deepest possible issues that every business person must confront and every business school must confront. And that's what we're going to be confronting today. Uh, let me say a few words about that debate, some common ground, if you will, that I think is uncontroversial among the four of us. Then I will give you a very brief introduction of the, the three panelists to my right, my colleagues to my right, and then we will get right into it because there is much to discuss here today. The latter part of our session will be left open for Q&A. So we want to hear from you and we want to engage if there are current events, for example, that seem to you to be quite relevant to anything any one of us has said, please don't hesitate to raise that as something you would like to see us address. Common ground. Uh, again, this is not part of the debate. This is, I believe, uh, something all of us subscribe to, and I'll be very quick. There are just three basic ideas that I would like to introduce as part of this, uh, of this common ground. The three ideas are, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of market failure. Market failure. It comes from an area of uh, scholarship that we call welfare economics. Market failure is topic one. Trade-offs between efficiency and equity is another topic that's fundamental and one that is appreciated by all. And the third element that I want to touch on very briefly is a notion of large versus small firms. So much of the debate about shareholders versus stakeholders is set in a professional management context, i.e. large firms, corporations, etc. I want to say a few words about this. All of these will be very brief. Market failure. When we think about what an individual does uh, in an economy, when we think about the trade-offs that we make, the decisions we make, should I buy this, should I produce this, what are the costs, what are the benefits, we've all thought about that, right? One way to think about how markets can get us to uh, the best possible outcome is when I, as an individual, in trading off the benefits to me as an individual and the costs to me as an individual, if those, in the jargon, if those marginal private costs and marginal private benefits, the ones that accrue to me, are also the same as the society as a whole would be thinking about. So here's a way of thinking about an economy where each individual is doing the best he or she can do in making those decisions, and each one of those marginal private benefits and costs is exactly lining up in a, an added-up sense to the marginal trade-offs that society itself would be making. So give me a concrete example. Suppose I choose to produce one more item in my factory or in my shop, okay? And I get a certain marginal cost from that. Uh, it may be that producing that item creates water pollution, some kind of pollution, what in, the, what in economics we call an externality. That would be a case where the cost that I see as an individual of producing one more item is not as high as society would feel, would interpret, because I am not taking into consideration uh, that externality, the pollution that I produce. It's a classic example of a market failure, a place where 
private decision making left to its own ends does not appreciate a distortion or a wedge between what society would choose to do and what the individual would choose to do. So that is very standard way of thinking about why markets don't always get things right. There are many types of market failures or distortions. Externalities is just one of them. Others will come up today. Point two, efficiency and equity. I'll be even more brief here. Uh, there's no sense in which economics says we should always choose the more efficient outcome or the most efficient outcome. It is well understood that in economics, we typically face trade-offs between efficiency and equity. And equity is something that one needs to make a decision on, as well as decisions about how to get the most efficient outcomes for a given level of equity. That is a very standard way of thinking about the field of welfare economics. And then the third point, small firms versus large firms. Again, we have in much of the modern economy, uh, economic activity is organized in larger organizations, most of them corporations. And we have professional managers. So in the jargon of all the classes you've taken, we have a separation of ownership and control. There's a group of owners, there's a group of managers. And the question is, what sorts of decisions are those managers going to make? So in a finance textbook, for example, when the question of shareholders and stakeholders rises, uh, the question of what should that manager do? What is the right criterion or decision rule? In an individual firm, I may be both the owner and the manager, right? I'm the owner, I'm the decision maker, and I can choose whether to maximize my own profit uh, in the long run or the short run, or I can also choose to do things that don't maximize my profit. That's obviously something an, an individual manager slash owner can do if he or she is, uh, is, is the owner in a small firm. Those are three elements that I think uh, we all effectively agree with. Now I'm going to very briefly introduce my colleagues. The first to speak will be Professor Hain Leland. Uh, Hain Leland is a huge reputation in the area of finance. So he comes at this from the fi finance perspective. He has done absolutely seminal work in the area of corporate finance, which is exactly this general area of what we're doing, also in an area called asset pricing. I would not be able to do justice to his long, long career, but he has made huge advances in our knowledge in the finance area. Uh, the second to speak uh, is, I believe, uh, Ernesto Dalbo will be speaking next. Uh, Ernesto works at the interface between economics and political science, thinks very, very hard about institutions and what institutions give us the right outcomes and, and why they don't, when they don't. He also teaches our, course, our core course in ethics here in the MBA core curriculum. Then we will have David Vogel. By the way, Hayne Leland is going to be speaking for the shareholder view. Ernesto will be giving the stakeholder view. We will go back to Professor David Vogel for more on the shareholder view. And David comes from also a uh, political economy background. He is uh, political science, does a lot of work at the interface of political science and other fields, holds a joint appointment in our political science department, has written a number of books. For example, he uh, has a book called The Market for Virtue. To what degree is virtuous behavior uh, reflected in market prices and compensated uh, in stock prices and, and other things? So he is a longtime expert in this area. My name is Rich Lyons. I'm the dean of the school. I am with Ernesto on the shareholder, or excuse me, the stakeholder side of this, and I will speak last. So each of us will have uh, three to five minutes to give some initial comments after my, uh, my common ground uh, comments that I just gave, and we'll turn it over to Hayne Leland. Thank you, Hayne. Uh, welcome to all. Thank you, Rich, for so succinctly summarizing 200 years of economic thought in roughly four minutes. Um, I will go back to that thought, starting with Adam Smith, who was the first to really uh, put to words um, the basis for the free enterprise profit-maximizing system. It, of course, continued through Milton Friedman, and I hope all of you have a chance to uh, read uh, Milton's uh, work, uh, including his New York Times Magazine article, which sort of set the uh, stage for uh, much of this debate. Finally, this is all of these thoughts which uh, 
uh, were first abstract, have been well formalized by Gérard de Bruy, uh, a late but important Berkeley faculty member in economics who won the Nobel Prize uh, maybe uh, 25 years ago. So economists have been emphasizing the importance of profit maximization when harnessed by competition. Profits represent the difference between the value of what is produced and what is used up in producing that. In that sense, profits are value added and society benefits from that. In this sense, profit is not just one goal amongst many equal competing goals, but the economic goal to promote economic well-being in allocating current resources. There are, of course, some caveats, some of which Rich uh, touched on and others will be pointing out uh, as we go on. My objective here is to show you that maximizing shareholder value becomes even more important in achieving dynamic goals, innovation, and growth, and allowing other stakeholders to dictate or even influence the decisions that serve the purpose of maximizing shareholder value will severely hamper the achievement of these dynamic goals. But first, a bit of theory. Um, the extension of profit maximization to a multi-period world has to bring in two key elements, elements that finance have emphasized. The time dimension. It's impossible to say you maximize just profits because profits today versus profits tomorrow may be a trade-off. So you have to bring in a weighting of profits today versus profits tomorrow. And secondly, uncertainty. How do you deal with the amount of risk, evaluating and taking into account the amount of risk that there is in any decision? Maximizing stock market value where stock markets reflect future discounted and risk-adjusted discounts of uncertain prospects, maximizing stock market value is the extension of profit maximization to this more realistic world. The important point here is that maximizing stock value will minimize the cost of raising new capital. And a lower cost of capital leads to more investment and greater growth. Following alternative objectives will raise the cost of capital, lower investment, and of course make it harder for firms that are trying to follow these other objectives, make it harder for them to compete. It is in the dynamics of an economy that stockholder value maximization is so important, driving innovation, investment, and growth. Now you say, well, perhaps stock market values are really short-sighted, and why should we be using those as any guide? Well, this is still an open debate, but a couple of facts. How could Amazon be selling at a price 57 times current earnings if shareholders weren't looking out to the future? How would an IPO, which is entirely based on future earnings, ever be successful. That's been one of the most dynamic aspects of the free market economy, has been the use of capital markets and IPOs to raise new risk capital. However, CEOs running firms may actually act in a short-sighted manner, even if stock values uh, have a longer, uh, longer view. CEOs may emphasize short-term earnings per share given their limited tenure and the nature of their reward structure. So please, let's not blame their myopic and perhaps other misbehavior on the stockholders. We have to worry about are we criticizing CEOs or are we criticizing value maximization? Let's keep that uh, separate. I want to spend just a second, since I'm already uh, almost out of time, on what would happen if we allowed other stakeholders to actually run the firm. Now, nobody's going to suggest that only these stakeholders run it, even though we're suggesting only shareholders run the firm. But let's do a little thought experiment. Bondholders in many firms provide more than 50% of the financing. So 
Why don't we let bondholders run the firm? They're stakeholders. Well, I think you can think that through. How would a firm be run differently? Certainly bondholders lose if things go badly. They don't gain if things go well. So in short, bondholders don't have the right incentives and would run a firm just tremendously conservatively. They'd never want it to have a loss. Clearly that would not serve the purposes of society, particularly dynamics. Say the workers run the firm. This has been tried before. Communes, kibbutzes, the Yugoslavian firm where workers divided profits. Even United Airlines was briefly run uh, by, uh, by the union and the workers. None of those approaches has really been a success, in large part because it has been so difficult to raise funds for investment and growth. As an outside investor, would you be willing to invest in a firm that has no incentive to maximize your return? and might even benefit from expropriating it. If capital can only be raised from the current workers themselves, growth opportunities clearly will be limited. This brings me to an inconvenient truth, economic Darwinism. In a highly competitive economy, free entry drives profits to zero. But if you're not maximizing profits, you're in trouble. It means you're running at a loss, and in the long run, you won't survive. So in short, even if you wanted to start out, as many of the co-ops have, consumer cooperatives, and tried to maximize something else, you will start running at a loss. Rich, you were on the board of the old Berkeley Consumer Co-op, where Andronico's on Shattuck Avenue currently is. Um, they eventually were driven out of business. I think in large part because it was difficult for them to raise new capital, being a co-op, and equally importantly, they just couldn't compete when uh, there were firms like Safeways and others coming in and, and uh, making it difficult to compete. So I've been pushing a point, it's one that I believe in. There are problems in our economy with lack of competition, incomplete markets or externalities, public goods, information asymmetries. But as Milton Friedman suggested, these are things that can or at least should be dealt with by public policy. In most, if not all cases, shareholder value maximization provides the right business incentives and has led to the richest economies we know, dynamic and innovative. Let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Thank you very much, Hain. Thank you. And we'll turn to Ernesto Dalbo, please, Ernesto. Okay. Thanks for uh, the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, so I have um, really three quick points I, I want to make. Um, but before I, I go there, I, I, I feel I have to respond to some of uh, uh, Hain's uh, uh, crafty points. Uh, one is that uh, in this debate, this is a trick we often see, and that is uh, assuming away the premise of the problem. Uh, one of these tricks is to say, well, you know, in equilibrium, you cannot do anything but maximize profits because otherwise uh, you will be driven out of business. Basically, what that means is you don't really have a choice. But if you really didn't have a choice, we wouldn't be here discussing what to do. What that goes to show is that people do have a choice, and the whole point is to figure out what they should do when they do have a choice, not when they don't. So let me then focus on the situations in which people really have a choice. So there's one thing that I believe is quite striking, and that is that Every time I ask a business person why they do what they do, they give me a justification that's very different from a selfish one. They never say, oh, just because I like it. Okay? That's the justification a serial killer would give you. Okay? Business people stay away from that kind of justification and for good reason. Because they internalize other concerns, a part of themselves. They go beyond themselves. And a typical justification is, well, what I do adds value. Right? What I do creates value for society, and it leaves society better than I found it. So when you push just a little bit, what you find out is that the justification business people have for doing what they do is really a utilitarian one. They believe in creating more wealth for everyone. Now, if that is a common goal that business people have, uh, and what makes them feel that their activities are really praiseworthy, then we have to ask what kind of uh, program or uh, a plan would best serve that ideal. 
If we were in a society without market failures, where the invisible hand works, then of course we know from Adam Smith and 200 years of economics that uh, asking people to act selfishly would get us there. The problem is that world doesn't exist. We live in a world where market failures do exist. And on top of that, government failures exist. So of course the other trick is typically to say, well, this is not my problem, let the government fix it. But that is the same as saying, let the market fix it. But the whole reason why we are here is that we know markets and governments fail. And the question is, what do we do when those two guys fail? My point is, if we want to serve that goal, that morality that most business people I know claim to care about, the only way is to internalize those externalities which was talking about. Because when we don't, then we're not really maximizing value. We might be destroying more than we create. So that's the first point. The second and third points are connected to Friedman. I think there, there's something quite spectacular going on here, and that is that Friedman's article doesn't say what people believe it says. This might come as a surprise, but really people think that what he said is, well, managers should maximize uh, profits for shareholders, period. Now, if you actually read this stuff, there's an advantage to actually reading it. <laughs> it says something else. So here's what it says. It says, yes, they should make as much money as possible while conforming to the basic rules of society, both those embodied in law and those embodied in ethical custom. That's quite different. So that is not saying managers or shareholders for that motive should follow a program of unconstrained profit maximization where they choose a quantity to be produced to maximize profits. They should follow a constrained profit maximization program where the constraints are the law and ethics. That means if you have a firm that stands to make a billion bucks by choosing its quantity unconstrained, and if respecting the ethical constraint would make a single dollar, that's what the firm should do, according to Friedman. So what Friedman is telling us is actually something spectacularly different to what people believe he was actually saying. In that statement, there is a fundamental value being placed on morality as a constraint on profit seeking. Now, what is that morality about? Well, typically it has to do with taking into account others. Really, that's the basis of all morality as far as humans know it. So my third point goes to complete this, this, the second one in terms of the unexpected implications of Friedman's text. One thing that Friedman is bothered by is this notion of having managers spending shareholders' money. And the reason he's bothered by that is because he says business people should act without deception or fraud. Spending shareholders' money, for instance, to donate to your favorite opera charity is, in some sense, spending other people's money. It is a form of theft. And the problem with Friedman is that he's a very moral guy. He's against theft. His morality is one of no theft. But if we subscribe to Friedman's morality, we have to buy into a bunch of logical, other logical implications. One is, if Getting, if theft against the shareholder is wrong because it is theft, theft for the shareholder is wrong too. And that is exactly what's going on when firms deplete collective assets that belong to the whole of society. What this tells us, in turn, is that one of those relevant ethical constraints on profit maximization is not expropriating others. And that means, basically, two things, internalizing externalities, or more broadly put, broadly taking into account all stakeholders that might be impacted by managerial decisions. My last point, if I'm allowed a, uh, another minute, is that that view from the Friedman text gives us a neat definition of what corporate social responsibility is. It is the ethics-based restraint of productive decisions when markets and governments have failed. But this is tightly connected to productive decisions and the pursuit of the mission of a firm. It has nothing to do with doing charity. So there is one other aspect that is, I think, right to criticize from the Friedman point of view, and that is that there's no reason why we should allow uh, people spending other people's money to do charity, when that has nothing to do with the productive mission of the firm. Uh, there's one last point I want to clear before uh, turning the, the, the table to, um, to David, and that is, Hain mentioned a potentially uh, Good point, but I will show you it, it isn't really, sorry to say. Um, as, man, as, as much as I would like to be a gentleman, on this one I, I can't. Uh, 
So he said, you know, what if, you know, the, the, the capital markets dry up? Because you could imagine investors saying, oh, gee, these managers are socially minded, you know, maybe, hmm, I, I'm not sure. Now, the problem with externality is that we are producing too much of certain things. If we don't have the right tax on carbon, right, and we're producing too much of it and killing ourselves too quickly, it would be a great thing if the cost of capital for the oil industry went up. That's exactly what we need. If the government won't impose what we call a Pigovian tax, the right tax on the output to reduce its quantity, then we ought to be imposing a tax on the inputs. So either moral managers will do it or the capital market will do it. And if they do it because they expect the managers to be moral, then they won't have to do so much of it. And we'll have some solution in the middle, a bit of morality, a bit of an extra Pigovian tax on the inputs. So that would not be a problem. In fact, it would uh, get us to the first best. And with that, I'm done. Thanks. David Vogel, please. Thanks. Hi. I want to begin um, by, uh, by discussing Friedman's argument, which is very influential. So as Ernesto pointed out, Friedman's basic criticism of corporate responsibility as it emerged during the 1960s was basically that managers were spending other people's money in the pursuit of their own personal values. And he thought that was irresponsible. And that was a powerful argument. The modern movement of corporate responsibility over the last 15 years has in some ways addressed Friedman's concerns and made them less relevant. Because the contemporary movement for corporate responsibility basically, or stakeholder management, basically says, yes, we understand that the primary goal of companies is to maximize the wealth of their shareholders. But we have a little twist. The best way to do that is to be responsible. The best way to do that is to also look after the welfare of other stakeholders. So basically, the modern corporate responsibility movement accepts Friedman's ends, but basically challenges his means. And so if you look at the uh, modern, modern corporate responsibility, the efforts of companies to engage in various social programs, et cetera, et cetera, um, I think Friedman uh, would find nothing whatsoever to object to, because basically these programs are justified uh, reasonably on the grounds that they are in the long-term interests of shareholders. The modern corporate responsibility movement basically says there's no trade-off between the two. Companies which are more responsible will also be more profitable and the circle becomes squared. Now, unfortunately, the evidence for this claim is pretty thin. Um, that is to say, there's very little, there's circumstantial evidence, but no convincing evidence that more responsible firms are more profitable. But the good news is there's also no evidence that more responsible firms are less profitable, which suggests that managers, as Ernesto suggests, do have discretion, and they are capable of addressing various social needs, internalizing externalities. There's a whole series of things which they are empowered to do, and the capital markets do not object to, their, uh, to these activities. They may not reward them, but they don't punish them. In other words, they are entirely consistent with profit maximization. Now, we have a problem. What happens when you have a situation in where there is a trade-off, in which managers are faced with a challenge, the opportunity to do something which they believe in good faith will, in both the long and short run, undermine shareholder value? The, uh, Nestor gave a good example, climate change. Here I am, I'm the chief executive officer of a company with heavy investments in fossil fuels, um, and I personally uh, care about global climate change. Could I, reasonably expect re could I reasonably be expected to move shareholder resources away from highly profitable fossil fuel production into less profitable alternative energy? Would that be something which we would realistically expect a manager to do? Of course not. I'm not even sure it's something that we would even want a manager to do. We would basically be, in, basically be empowering a manager to undermine shareholder value in the pursuit of their own personal values. So, what, so it's all well and good to say it's nice if companies internalize their externalities, negative externalities, and many companies have done so in environmental areas, et cetera. But what happens when there's a trade-off? What happens if you internalize your negative externalities, if you produce more social goods at a price of undermining shareholder value? 
What can we expect companies to do? And I think the answer is any, we cannot expect any company um, to deliberately and consciously uh, make those trade-offs. Now, the question is how important are those market failures? That is to say, to what extent can we expect companies to internalize ex negative externalities in ways that don't undermine their profitability? Okay, there's space there, okay? And that's the space for corporate responsibility, and it's a real and viable space. But what happens when you have business activities which fall outside of that space, when you really have trade-offs? And there, I think, you have a classic market failure. There, I think, we cannot expect companies to, um, to abandon the interests of their shareholders in the pursuit of other values. What do we do then, okay? Well, that's where we have public policy, okay? The role of public policy is to change the incentives of managers so as to align the, to us to align the interests of shareholders and to align the interests of managers. So in the case of climate change, we put a tax on fossil fuels, okay, which means that it now makes business sense for that manager to divert resources from fossil fuels into alternative energy, or we subsidize alternative energy, whatever. And in that way, we reconcile shareholder interests and the public interests. So it seems to me that um, to the extent that we have cases of market failures, and those are important. I don't want to rely on the ethics of managers to address them. Um, I don't want to rely on their social conscience. I don't think they, we can realistically rely on their long-term vision of, um, of improving shareholder value. I think in those cases, um, there's a, an indispensable role for government regulation, which will then enable managers to maximize profits, but to doing so in ways which are in the broader public interest. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Uh, so I will, uh, I will weigh in on the side of, of uh, the stakeholders along with Ernesto, and then we will open it up for questions. Uh, let, let me address uh, some of the points that David just made. I, I think I wrote it as a direct quote. We cannot expect companies to abandon the interests of shareholders. So the way I think about this debate and really the Friedman framing of it is uh, not uh, shareholders get 100% of the weight versus shareholders get 0% of the weight, uh, which the word abandon might suggest. But rather, I think realistically, in looking at this debate over many decades, it is whether a textbook in finance should suggest that it's 100% managers or whether it's less than 100% managers. That's the way I think about the debate. So the shareholders or the stakeholder side of the debate is really about whether this 100% iron law on the shareholder best interests is the right way to, uh, to run a firm. Uh, so David mentioned that public policy is the way to handle this if we have a market failure. And we all agree that there are good examples of market failures. Uh, Ernesto made the point that there's such a thing as government failure as well, right? That our institutions don't necessarily get this exactly right. Uh, David would, of course, agree with that. Uh, but that's part of the question here is when public policy is not getting it right enough or can't be expected to, and I think in the financial industry over the last three years, We've seen public policy getting things less than right, as well as other elements of the system, obviously. Um, and, and the question is whether, uh, whether that shareholder uh, maximization as a 100% principle is the right way to think about it. Let me reframe it a bit. One of my own colleagues uh, who's in the room, uh, one of my finance colleagues, made this point to me this morning, and I think it's a good one. Look, suppose we go back to the situation where this isn't about conflict of interest between managers and owners. That's a very important potential conflict of interest in thinking about corporate America or corporate, corporate world. Right? Um, if I own a company right now, and I own a company, and I'm thinking about, and I'm, so I'm the manager and the owner, so we take away this whole question of the separation of ownership and control, and then the question is, are you going to tell me that I, as an individual, should be maximizing my own long-term wealth, or uh, the shadow value of what my stock would price would sell for, or, you know, right? The question is, no, I might very well want to run my company in a way that does well enough on the profit side, uh, but also addresses some of these other, uh, some of these other considerations. Uh, I think Hain would naturally ask, well, you will be driven out of the equilibrium and probably quickly. And I would argue, no, not necessarily quickly. If I'm bending away from 100% long-term value maximization just, just a little bit. Um, 
The, the, here, something somebody said to me uh, recently, a separate point now, that, uh, that spoke to me. And um, in fact, this was Stephen Bechtel mentioned this to me very recently. And he said, look, if there is a conflict, if you are feeling a conflict between uh, short-run profits or value uh, and, uh, and what the firm should be doing, uh, you probably aren't looking out far enough. And so the, the point here is that uh, share, the, the managers will presumably do the best they can. Uh, but managers very often are not that good at maximizing long-term value. Uh, Hain made this point, either because there are short-run incentives that distort them and so forth. Hain said, let's separate this fact that CEOs or other managers uh, face distorted environments and often make mistakes. I think he would also agree, I would certainly agree, that sometimes people are less rational and do make bad judgments and things like that. Um, that that is not a reason that we should bend away from shareholder maximization. Uh, but I, I do view that as a situation. I do believe that there are important people in important seats in this very important economy uh, for people's welfare that when told you just need to maximize shareholder wealth, that they will not be maximizing long-run value in the way that even Hain describes, and I'm very convinced that they wouldn't be maximizing long-run social value if you actually told them that's all they need to do. Uh, now, let's open it up for your questions. We have until 1.30. We have a hard stop at 1.30. It's 10 after 1. And all of us are available to your thoughts or questions. We will leave about five minutes at the end so that each of us can, can get some more points on the table, because I'm sure each of us would like to put a concluding thought or two on the table. Please, anyone. Now, we have to go use the microphones, please, because we are streaming video cast this. Please come to a microphone. And uh, we will also be saving it in our uh, video content room, please. Hi, uh, so I have a question for Professor Leyden. Um, it's sort of borrowing from the ideas that you spoke about, uh, d um, So you mentioned that if you have a shareholder maximization, um, they're going to reduce the costs of production and de thereby maximize uh, value for the society as a whole. Well, I would argue that if you take an exaggerated example, which might be a little bit cliched in um, the past couple of years, but just say you look at AIG, that's exactly what they did. They minimized their cost of um, providing insurance by providing too much of it. And of course, this again relates to the point of being short-sighted about it. But I would say that if, if we look at, if you borrow an idea or two from finance, um, I would argue that what we really have to maximize is a risk-adjusted shareholder value. And the best person to do that would be the bondholders. I'm not saying they should run it, but it should be some sort of compromise between the two. Because obviously, um, it is... Um, through whatever uh, human uh, policies there might be, it's just not possible for managers to be looking at the long-term shareholder value, um, uh, the long-term stock value, and the bondholders do have a long-term incentive. And if, if you just look at the markets, this supports it. The, share, the, the stocks are so much more, uh, experience so much more turnover. It's not like the bond markets. So they are the ones who are really holding on to this for a longer period of time. So I would suggest that there should be some sort of compromise between the two. Okay, thanks. Please. Well, I, th I think you make a very good point, and this is endemic to our entire industrial as well as financial society. Our tax laws, which are a matter of public policy, by the way, our tax laws give tremendous incentives for firms to take on a lot of debt because the cost of debt is tax deductible and the cost of equity is not. So we put this huge incentive on firms to lever up once firms have a lot of leverage, then it's not just the shareholders who are bearing the gains and the losses. Suddenly, the bondholders are being subjected to risk by the shareholders' decisions and being subjected to possible expropriation of value if the firm, as in AIG's case, takes on a lot more risk. So I would agree that in that case, uh, you know, the bondholders who probably won't refinance the bonds <laughs> if, if they really feel they're being had. But, so they have some control. But they don't have direct control, and I agree there is a problem here. How do you fix that problem? Well, you're not going to do it within the firm, because we've set up incentives outside the firm that say you should do this. What we've got to do is reform the way in which we allow 
debt to be tax deductible, interest to be tax deductible, and not allow a corresponding treatment of equity. Gary. Thank you, Hank. Uh, other questions, please, uh, microphone. Students. Professor Willie Fuchs. So um, the question is the following. So both uh, Hain and, and, and David have pointed out that the, you know, the problem is should be dealt by public policy. I guess partly because I come from Argentina and don't trust public policy to solve all the problems. Uh, but I think that the key issue arises when public policy is wrong or, or doesn't really supervise correctly even if the policy is in place. Suppose I have a factory next to a river. And you know, there might be or might not be a policy to say I shouldn't dump acid into the river. But even if the policy is in place, nobody will see it. I can do it at night. And you know, if, if you think of the long run, maybe indeed I will be caught. And therefore, then I, I wouldn't do it because uh, you know, I would be considering the risk of being caught. But let's, just to make the argument very stark, assume I will not be caught. Once I dumped it, there's no evidence, only I know it. So now the question is, is very clear. For profit maximization, it will be cheaper for my firm to dump the asset there. So now it's, it's sort of a moral question. Should I dump the asset or should I not dump the asset? In the same way you tell a two-year-old kid to dump you know, the trash in the street or not. He's not going to go to jail or anything. It's just the question is, is it the right thing to do or not? And should you take into account that by doing it, you have an externality in the rest of the society? I mean, I think the answer to that is very straightforward. If you as a manager believe that dumping that, that affluent into the water is wrong, and socially irresponsible, and the law, there's laws which restrict that, but they're not enforced, then what you should do is work hard to change public policy so those laws are better enforced, and so that you then will have an incentive in your interest not to dump the asset, and your competitors will have a similar interest. So I think that part of it, what it is to be a responsible manager is to support sound public policy, such as increasing, for example, the budget for the enforcement agency that will create a level playing field and enable you to act responsibly in ways that do not undermine the interests of your shareholders. I completely agree with that, but, but you haven't answered the question. Would you dump the asset or not? I mean, on top of that, you should go and, and talk to your you know, congressman, but that night, would you dump it or not? I think that uh, um, disobeying the law is not responsible. So the answer is, I think you shouldn't dump the asset. And if there weren't the law? What? If there weren't the law. If there weren't a law, okay, that, okay that's interesting. Now, it's still I, acid, by the way. It's so. still acid, okay. Before you change the premise of a problem. Okay, okay. okay, if there wasn't a law, then I think the question would be, what are the trade-offs? I mean, how expensive would it be? Okay, I think you'd have to think about it. Uh, can I manage to come out with a product, to develop a, produ a creative production process that uses less acid and is also financially viable? That's very possible, right? Um, and we have a lot of examples from sustainability that companies can do that. So the first thing I would say was, can I come up with some ways of reducing my environmental impact that do not undermine my competitive position? And if the answer is yes, I should do that. Now, what happens if not dumping the acid would dramatically undermine the competitiveness of my company? Then I think it'd be very hard to expect that manager to commit economic suicide. I'm sorry, please use the microphone. Thank you. Hi. Um, I wanted to follow up on that question. I actually had a similar one. Um, maybe it helps to make the, the example a little bit more dramatic because I think everybody's concerned about the environment, but you can always um, you know, augment your environmental impact by doing some environmental good in other parts of the business. But let's say we talk about diamond mining. And we're talking about a country where public policy is not enforced and not even in place. So say there's not even a law around labor rights. And it's exponentially cheaper to outsource your mining labor to somebody who you don't really know where they're getting their people from or how they're paying or whatever. You don't ask questions, and that's what all your competitors are doing. At what point, knowing that you are either probably, or you can make an argument, you know definitely that you're using, say, slave labor or child labor or whatever, that's an immoral humanity. At what point do you draw the line on your moral compass or your moral sliding slope or whatever and say that as a manager, I should not be doing just what's profitable, but I have to do what I know is right? And I, I understand all the points that you're making 
from a theoretical basis, but we don't operate in a theoretical world. So when do you say that this is just wrong? If I become a manager of a diamond business, when do I draw that line? And how can I make the case? Sure, you can work for years and years and years trying to make your developing country have a more effective public policy, but that's impractical. It's not going to happen. So how would you respond to that problem? They're asking you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would love to respond, but I, I, I hate to be yeah. to intrude. <laughs> she, you would agree. I mean, I I mean, you raise an, an important real issue, which is, and we do have a solution. I mean, we have the Kimberley Accord, in which the major diamond producers and the major diamond uh, retailers and the major diamond processors have got together and developed a voluntary code to track the sources of diamonds to eliminate so-called conflict or blood diamonds within the market. It's been extremely successful. Uh, the amount of conflict in blood diamonds has dramatically declined. So there's an example of private corporate responsibility, but collective action where the industry gets together, led by De Beers, who has a, obviously a major stake in reputation of uh, keeping, you know, in terms of the reputation of diamonds. Um, and, um, and we actually have a viable industry code um, of global corporate responsibility, which has done a very effective job in, um, in, policing, um, in policing diamond sources. Okay, let's, move to, let's move it to sapphires. Sapphires, I don't know if you're aware, but it's the same issue, but there's no De Beers code or Kimberly process for sapphires. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 what I cannot do is to promise to answer like you would, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, then. Um, so I, there's one clarification I would like to make, and that is that uh, there's two, there's a basic point that I believe Rich and I uh, wanted to make, and then there's a a variety of complex points that then we will need to make to answer these types of questions. The minimalist point is that we don't believe, for the reasons, the reasons we've um, uh, shown, that it is possible to uh, run a business focusing on 100% uh, on profits. Um, why? Well, because we have some sort of moral consideration at play. Um, and the, the only point we need to make this is that the only alternative to that would be to have a completely amoral position. But first, none, no person I know doing business would subscribe to that fully amoral position. Two, even the Friedman position is not that, even if people don't realize it. Having said that, then the question is, okay, if we now agree that we're going to have to get some other broader compass to balance stakeholders' interests, what should that be? And that is the question you're asking. They say, there's a great class in the first year in the core called Ethics, subtitled Judging Others, which is a lot of fun. And that is all about answering these types of questions. Uh, when it comes to issues like the ones you've been raising, then this is one of the uh, best examples, because things are very stark. Um, so there's trade-offs that can, that, that happen if you're a utilitarian and you're thinking, well, I can create wealth for these people or for th those people, and you know, it's all about economic trade-offs. Um, but there are other things that come into play when you're dealing with things like basic freedoms. Uh, and these have a whole different uh, moral connotation. Uh, utilitarian theory doesn't make a distinction for these things, but other moral theories, like Kantianism, does. Uh, so Kant has a very nice phrase that says, you know, in, in the kingdom of ends, that is, you know, in, in the world, there's things that have a price and things that have a dignity. And what this means is that when we are dealing with things like basic freedoms of people, then a different set of moral considerations and analysis uh, comes to bear. Uh, the short answer is it would be very difficult to plan on expanding profits at the cost of subjecting people to treatment that they would not accept voluntarily. That is completely out of bounds by you know, most non-utilitarian moral theories. I think it's, go, this way. Um, I think it's important to realize that Friedman was speaking in the context of a theory that did assume that uh, there was competition. The moment, for example, competition, not to mention these other uh, you know, externalities that are being talked about. The moment we don't have competition, everything's out the door in terms of economic theory saying that profit maximization is a good thing. And as Adam Smith himself recognized, whenever you get two merchants together, it is rare, but they don't conspire to fix prices. 
So there has to be some outside guidelines in place, for example, a, um, uh, an antitrust kind of world or at least some um, limits uh, enforcing the enforced competition. And I think when you're too far outside a society that has some of those limits, and there's a very good question as to whether profit maximization makes sense. To me, the question that's relevant is in our society right now, should we in the United States uh, think that the limits we know we face, for example, fishing is a wonderful example, and it's an international problem just um, goes beyond that. There are certain areas in which there are problems, but is it worth saying, all right, let's abandon uh, shareholder uh, wealth maximization and replace it with, say, uh, workers maximizing profit per worker? Well, I've pointed out that that raises a whole Pandora's box of other questions, and it's very easy to sit back and say, in a second best world, there's something wrong here and here. And the examples that were brought out in foreign countries, I think, are, are quite compelling. But relevant to us, uh, if we value the dynamics that we have in our system as well as our resource allocation, I think we should think very heavily about you know, not what's necessarily wrong, but are we going to get any better if we take out this as an objective, which has served us well, and replace it uh, with uh, a cacophony of voices where maybe even the manager doesn't know what he wants to do. So that's my... Uh, Thank you, Hayne. We have time for one more question, and then we'll have one minute of summary for, for each of the four of us. Please, anybody. Please, sir, right here. Hi. Uh, Hayne just spoke to this a little bit, uh, but it seems to me that the talk has been a lot about shareholder wealth and maximizing, maximizing shareholder wealth, and I was wondering if maybe the discussion could be reframed a little bit on the concept of what uh, shareholders are really looking for, and I understand with institutions it generally is just monetary wealth, uh, but it seems to me that there's a, maybe a growing trend. I don't know the, the area very well, but there seem to be a lot of individuals who are interested more in uh, socially responsible investing. I'm, I'm hearing that a lot, at least in the Bay Area. And uh, I'm wondering whether you think there's any, uh, anything to that trend and whether there's any uh, possible rewriting of the contract between shareholder and manager. I mean, I would say <coughs> to me two things. I think in the, in for a broad publicly held company, uh, those social investors are, um, are just too trivial, too, too unimportant to make a difference. I think if you are an investor, who cares, has social values, and that's completely reasonable. Um, what you should do is not buy shares in an ethical investment fund. Uh, what you should do is uh, form you know, an, uh, a privately held firm or a concentrated group of shareholders. You have all these so-called B corporations, social enterprises, a huge amount of space in our economy for companies which are established. With, with triple bottom line objectives, which at the get-go are willing to make off, tra are willing to make trade-offs between profits and responsibility, and their shareholders are aware of that. I think that's a very viable and uh, a very viable um, alternative. I think the the social responsibility movement as a shareholder movement goes wrong in that it a actually claims that those social investment funds will perform better because basically more responsible firms will be more profitable. That I think is an illusion. Why don't, why don't we go through uh, and, and sequence the, the final comments? Since I got to go last on the panel, I will go first. Why don't we do it in, in reverse order? I just want to make two very, very quick points. Uh, there seems to me, it, it came up in both Hain and David's comments, this notion of abandoning uh, shareholder maximization and replacing it with something that sounded quite radically other, whether it was worker-governed systems or bondholder-governed and so forth. Uh, as I said before, for me it is, do we teach students uh, and, and society that it is 100% shareholders or don't we? And Ernesto and I feel that it is uh, not 100% shareholders. Now, I do believe that there are lots of situations where managers can uh, commit theft from shareholders. Uh, uh, it's, this is not advocating a no-holds-barred position. The notion is consider judgment. I want managers to use it. Final point, I think there's an element that managers regularly make a mistake on, and that is what I'll call reputation risk. If you tell somebody who's 
young, early in their career, anybody, that they should just share, maximize shareholder wealth, and that is it. They often uh, grossly or can grossly underestimate uh, the damage to long-run shareholder value from reputation risk that gets undermined from mistakes in the public eye. David. Um, let me just say a few words on management education. I think a major problem with management education is that it encourages students to overvalue the social value and contributions of markets. Markets can address many problems. We have social enterprises. We can do things in a creative, social responsible way. Um, but I think markets also have limits. Um, and I think one of the problems in management education is we don't teach students about those limits. We teach them about what markets can do, but we don't think, teach them about what markets cannot do. We don't teach them how to identify market failures. And we don't teach them to think about creative and responsible public policy solutions which can address those market failures. And I, I think that, um, I think more generally, um, I think management education suffers from the fact that I suspect one can go through much of the curriculum uh, in, the pr in programs of the business school without ever hearing anything about government. Thank you, David. Ernesto. Um, there's one important point, I think, in terms of uh, figuring out what is what is it that applies to us? So uh, following on, on Haynes' uh, characterization of the problem. I think the, the fascinating issue for us is that what applies to us nowadays is what applies to everybody. Uh, business has become uh, irreversibly global. Uh, and therefore, what applies to us basically is whatever is happening in the world. Many of these examples that you know, were thrown in, like the one on diamonds, I mean, it's, you know, it's Western firms that maybe are uh, involved in uh, Eastern countries and vice versa. Uh, so basically, when uh, nasty stuff is happening in some remote corner of the world, that might well be our own business environment. And therefore, uh, the, the need for uh, a moral compass that uh, helps us navigate those problems is really uh, a must. Um, the, the second issue is that, um, uh, coming to this issue of the trends, I, I believe that morality is what in economics we call a superior good. That is, the more wealthy you get, the more you want to demand of it. So I think, I believe in progress. The, uh, uh, the world has never been as well fed, clothed, and sheltered as it is today. Um, and I have reason to believe that unless we, uh, do, you know, uh, unless we get wrong solving some of the unsustainabilities that we currently face, this might continue to be the case. And the more it continues to be the case, the more people will want to be not only wealthy, but also moral. So some of these considerations on uh, how to invest and how to conduct our business are here to stay. Um, lastly, there is always this issue of, well, are we not driving shareholders away and so on? I think partly uh, this reflects two issues. One, as Rich says, this is not about bang-bang solutions. It's not about whether driving shareholders value to zero. It's about whether thinking we need a broader global compass than, this, uh, than the simple uh, instruction, go maximize uh, profit. Um, so what we, I think we are advocating is more, cons a more considered judgment uh, that has some um, uh, tools for analysis that can help people make uh, the judgments they, they, they have to make. Well, in the grand sweep of history, more of which I've probably seen than the other people at this uh, <laughs> uh, table, <laughs> but speaking even from my narrow band, um, Profit maximization, I think, has, although not perfect, served us well. Uh, I think if you look at China, uh, it's hard to argue that freeing up their economy and allowing people to per, uh, pursue uh, profit opportunities has had an enormous impact, most of it for the good. Now, you may say, yeah, but look at the mines and all the coal that's been, that happened, that was going on far before they freed up the economy. This is not, uh, you know, just the fault of the free economy. We want profit maximization, but as David pointed out, it's important to be aware of where the failures are, it's important for us to teach those, and it's important for people to have some idea of the kinds of things that might correct this. A cap and trade, I'm sure you've all heard of that. Well, there may be cleverer ways uh, of dealing with some of these problems. 
Uh, Eleanor Ostrom has talked about how you can handle public goods, uh, or at least uh, uh, resource pools, uh, effectively without necessarily having legal approaches, but simply uh, cooperation. So, you know, I, even though I'm not wearing a tie, I may uh, sound like the hardcore capitalist that I probably am. Uh, but this, this is a goal that has served us well, and I think it's very dangerous. Uh, and I think what you need to do, economics is all about incentives. And look hard what the incentives will be if seemingly good guys, uh, who still act in their own self-interest, are allowed to be dictating the decisions of the firm. I have chosen to look at extremes. The bondholders run the firm, or uh, the consumers run the firm, and I'm, I'm not sure I ever got to that, but it's in my notes, uh, and the problems that creates. Now, Rich is saying, well, nobody expects us to go 100% to one extreme or the other. But the moment you open the door a little bit, these voices are gonna come in, and they're not necessarily voices that are going to improve things. Maybe, I will have to grant the other side, they've done a good job of argument, maybe a little bit, but not much. Thank you, my colleagues, and thanks to all of you.